our last speaker um, went to my school. Uh, the next speaker, our keynote speaker tonight, went to my university. I know what you're thinking, Mary. Stop talking about your own privileged education. I can't help it. I'm trying to bond with my guests. He's already here. He's going to push me off the podium before I can get to introduce him. Oh, there you go. Prince, <laughs> Prince Hassan bin Talal of Jordan. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أجمعين أيها الجمع الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and the answer is وعليكم السلام thank you ladies and gentlemen when Mandag Morgan took the initiative of the coexistence of civilizations in 2006 after the first cartoon crisis. We came from the five continents to develop a coexistence expedition. Our objectives were to qualify cross-cultural encounters, to qualify the level of debate and communication among citizens in general and decision makers, to develop a tool, an analytical framework specified in great detail by the end of 2007. Norway succeeded Denmark in the chairmanship of the Nordic Council and the initiative expired. I have worked with the late Prince Sadruddin Aga Khan since 1981 to 1988 on a call for a new international humanitarian order. Our colleagues included from this country, David Owen, from France, Simone Weil, herself a Holocaust survivor, Robert McNamara, as he told me, a born-again peacemaker, and many others from different parts of the world. We were challenged, we came here to speak of challenges, by man against nature. Al Gore speaks of global warming, I speak of human warning. Man-made disasters, but most significantly, we spoke of man against man. Pope Francis, has told us on more than one occasion that I've been privileged to call on him that the world is at war. And I would like you all to stand for a moment's heartfelt reflection in memory of all the victims of the consequences of war that we are seeing every day of our lives. I want to remind you that a Nigeri Nigerian girl, aged 10, killed as many as 20 people today by blowing herself up in broad daylight. So please join me in a moment of reflection. Thank you all very much. Jazakumullah khairan. I know I'm speaking in London, the de facto intellectual capital of the Middle East. <laughs> Not Beirut, Damascus, or Baghdad. I know that in this great city, and I know from bitter experience that in Birmingham, too, you have radical nationalists, pan-Arabists, Islamists. In fact, the last time I spoke at Selly Oaks, I was heckled. Fourteen of them, Taliban at the time, a new word at that time to the British authorities. 
You will die and, and roast in hell, they said, with your friend Ishaq Rabin. I was trying to describe the Jordanian-Israeli peace treaty in 1994. And I said, thank you very much indeed. I thought the day of judgment was about us all, not about me and my friend Ishaq Rabin alone. There I go on, from the Middle East you have Democrats, liberals, Baathists, monarchists, every shade of Arab, Kurdish, Turkish, Iranian political opinion can be found in this British capital. Sir Alistair Duncan spoke a minute ago about generosity of spirit. I am here to speak to you about the importance of the generosity of intellect. If we are to take seriously the eight different perspectives that we identified after the Danish cartoon, and now after, is it in the next couple of days, the million reproduction of the cartoons, which all contribute with different explanations of the clashes between so-called Western values and Islam, I think the time has come to remind ourselves that the action, actions of ISIL, ISIS, Daesh are not representative of Islam and are unjustifiable under Islamic law. Naftali Bennett, and Bibi Netanyahu appeared at the same time in Israel. Of course, there are elections looming. Naftali Bennett, and I quote, because I heard him on television, said, you should not try to understand Islamic violence or Muslims. You should know how to fight them and kill them. Nobody, of course, waxes poetic about the statements of Naftali Bennett, but I'm sure there are many of you around this room who are going to put me in hot water after I have finished my remarks here today. But I have to tell you the truth. Sharia and the specific norms of Sharia reject unjustified killing of civilians, infliction of torture, and other cruel, unusual, and degrading forms of treatment and punishment as committed by any of these groups, as well as others, which constitute in Islam the had crime of Hiraba and Qisas. I don't want to go into details, but I do want to tell you that if you so wish, any of the media present to challenge this statement, please be aware of the fact that these acts and others similar to them, in particular indiscriminate attacks upon civilian population, are in violation of international humanitarian law and also constitute a violation of the Sharia. I wanted to point out that there is nothing in Islamic law that justifies or excuses these types of prohibited acts. Irrespective of the goals of the perpetrators, Islam does not recognize an ex as an excuse for the violation of a specific Sharia norm that the ends justifies the means. May I also take this opportunity just to mention to you in the words of Mahatma Gandhi, I had the privilege of receiving in Morehouse College years ago, an African-American college, the Gandhi King Ikeda Prize. And I started my remarks by saying, quoting Gandhiji, what is faith if not translated into action? This gigantic Muslim wealth when will we be given the right to institutional self-determination to create an international zakat fund with two seditious words, accountable and transparent? We speak of intellectual generosity, 
when will we be given the courtesy of the intellectual generosity by the largely Western sovereign wealth fund managers who are more interested in the fluctuations of the prices of oil and gas and in buying weapons than they are in enabling and empowering citizens of a greater and broader patriotism in our West Asian region. It was Winston Churchill who in 1946 in Zurich called for a broader patriotism. If you can be a European, a German, a Bavarian, and a Catholic, why can you not be an Arab, a Syrian, an Aleppo, and an Orthodox Christian? When my great uncle, King Faisal I, the founder of modern Syria, met Chaim Weizmann, they believed in equal rights for Jews, Christians, and Muslims of Arab culture. That was in 1918. By 2018, one century since Versailles, will we be made to feel safer by the United States and Russia talking to each other, practicing what they preach, Jonathan Maginot, Rabbi Jonathan Maginot, and I studied Hebrew at Oxford, it's no secret. I am proud of the fact that I have continued with my links and ties with many of my Oxford friends. In talking to the other, Jonathan Maginot suggested that a prerequisite to successful dialogue is that everyone comes to the table with their dignities intact and that narrow convictions and pre-existing polarities should be abandoned. If that were the case, we would not be apologizing to each other and qualifying our statements at such great length here today. The four fundamental values of the Holy Quran Benevolence, Ihsan, Justice, Adl, Compassion, Rahmah, and Wisdom, Hikmah, all indicate our commitment to combating the degradation of the human condition, to the demise of public reason, as well as the diminishment of regional and global commons. The great divide, Sir Alistair Duncan referred to Sunni and Shia, is not between Sunni and Shia. I had the privilege of moderating Sunni and Shia delegations only a few short weeks ago in the Holy See in a conversation between Protestant and Catholic and Muslim, we were all Muslim participating in a call for action which has since been published, which it may not surprise you to know, addressed the importance of bridging the gap between theology and practicality. The great divide is between terrorists and rationalists, or moderates as we sometimes describe them or, if you like, between those who are tolerant and those who otherize. i like to thank Shirley Williams, our colleague on the Nuclear Threat Initiative, on which I have served with Sam Nunn for the last 10 years, for her coinage of politics where people matter. I don't know whether Sir Alistair feels that that puts me slightly to the left, more on the side of Mehdi Hassan. I don't know, Mehdi, when you refer to all those lefties, whether you included His Royal Highness or not. <laughs> but if you ask him, you might get an answer. In his encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, Pope John Paul II stated 
that he had presented a view of a terrestrial globe as a map of various religions. The multi-layer effects of globalization and mass migration have been reflected in the constant, constantly shifting margins that once existed between religion and geography. Psychologists, trauma counselors, teacher training programs, sociologists are yet another vehicle for our interfaith efforts or our human commitment, people of faith or no faith, as Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth told us in her Christmas message. Human beings all. Reconsidered curriculum for children, accessible literature for adults, and by all means, a new approach by the media in all its forms to developing not a monologue about the need for dialogue, but a regional West Asian, North Africa, Middle East, if you will, citizens' assembly. Like the Helsinki Citizens' Assembly. This conversation we're having here with modern technology could have been carried all over the West Asian region. The media has an ethical responsibility which it fulfills at the cost of human life. And I pay my respect to Marie Colville, who lost her life in Syria, and to many others who have seen it through to the bitter end. But from coexistence to interexistence, we have to recognize that the conflict is not only between regions. In Europe, you speak of good neighborhoodly, good neighborhood relations. Russia speaks about Eurasian relations. Can you please tell me what is the difference? The Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea, and we are geopolitically, my tiny country is geopolitically a Mediterranean country, are a region which has contributed for centuries to feeding Greek Sanskrit and Chinese ideas into Europe, England, France, Germany, and Italy. Richard Bullitt of Columbia University even called it Islamo-Christian civilization. But today, the harsh realities are that we are being dehumanized. Our best and our brightest are migrating. Human capital is in an outflight from the region or from within the region to the wealthiest parts of that region. According to the High Commission for Refugees, financial requirements to deal with the humanitarian fallout of the Syrian crisis and provide assistance to refugees comes to about 1.9 billion. Now the average, ladies and gentlemen, for a refugee, stateless person, displaced person, etc., with all the different agendas of the UN agencies, living on someone else's soil is 27 years. 1.9 billion is not what we expect to hear. And as I said to the Swedish ambassador, when we speak of resilience in Swedish terminology, we expect an interdisciplinary eco-social approach to a stabilization of our region. When I spoke in this manner to the G8 Sherpas, they said, well, why do you want a regional development bank? You have SMEs. I said, well, our whole economy is SMEs. But why is it that Arabs can serve on the Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank, and yet they cannot express themselves institutionally, either in the traditional form, zakat, or in the modern parlance. In terms of the water-energy-environment nexus, 
there is strong evidence of popular apathy in our part of the world. For example, the UN-led World We Want survey ranked the chief concerns of a sample poll of 50,000 Jordanians among basic economic, social, and political rights with a conspicuous absence of interest in content, protecting forests and rivers, action on climate change, were last of 16 priority areas, while access to clean water and sanitation ranked eighth. We are the third thirstiest country in the world. You mentioned 5% of Britain's population are Muslims. 8% of my country's population are Syrians. Not to mention Iraqis and the human consequences of the wars in the region. So I would like to wrap this up by saying that in advocating integration of quality and equality of access across national boundaries, a carrying capacity for our region, as well as, well as between and within marginalized groups, not as Peter Sutherland says, the refugees, refugee stakeholders on Mars and the national stakeholders on Venus, but people all, without discrimination, please remember 20, 30, 45 million Egyptians from the Delta, the Nile Delta, will be on the march looking for alternative habitation. The Nahda Dam is deoxygenating water that should be used for agriculture in the Delta. And correspondingly, 45 million Iranians are threatened by drought, which of course was one of the reasons for the beginning of the violence and the spiral of violence in Syria. I would like to ask you in the coming sessions when we get together to consider your earlobe for a moment, a lowlab in Arabic. It is the triple helix the outer ring, the inner ring, and the middle ear. The triple helix for me is politics, economics, and civil society. Mehdi, I'm sorry you're looking at your watch, and I have overstayed my welcome, but I would like to thank you in particular for your patience and for your accepting that I should, at your invitation, unceremoniously push you aside. But that was not out of lack of respect for you or for the industrial, uh, sorry, uh, for the, uh, the illustrious school to which you and Alistair Duncan went, which you have not quite revealed to us yet. Okay. Well, thank you all for your patience.